Thanks for listening to A Long Time in Finance with Jonathan Ford and Neil Collins in partnership with Briefcase News, the service that brings intelligent curation and analysis to your media monitor. We thought we'd do something this week on Ponzi schemes, Neil. Oh, um, one yes. of your favourite subjects. Ponzi schemes. Partly because of the unravelling of this uh, crypto empire under the control of... What's his name? Sam Bankman Freed. Fried. 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 No, it's definitely a, quite fried. No, we've, yeah, we've... <laughs> uh, which many people are calling, uh, allegedly calling a Ponzi scheme. And there's also this very interesting, enjoyable documentary on Netflix about Bernard Madoff, who's... Yes, who who lends scheme. himself to another terrible pun. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll avoid that. Whose Ponzi scheme, I think, is actually, even despite SBF... Probably the biggest ever at $64 billion. Certainly compared to everything that went before, it was an order of magnitude at least bigger. And even more importantly for a Ponzi scheme, is where are this being the biggest ever? It's also the longest lasting. The original scheme, I think, was set up by Charles Ponzi after the First World War, promising an enormous return on stamps. 50% in 45 days was what he was offering. But that failed in a year. Yes. Madoff, on the other hand, span his out for... Decades, perhaps one form or another since the early 1960s. I must say, is it compared to Mr. Ponzi, yeah. it Madoff makes him look like an amateur. Yes. We, to, to discuss this case, the great Madoff case, and, and the art of the Ponzi scheme, we are joined by Dan Davis, a stock market analyst, author, whose book, Lying for Money, available in all good sh- bookshops, is a history of financial fraud. So welcome, Dan. Hi, thanks very much for having me back. I thought we might start by a little bit of a background for listeners who don't know much about the Madoff case and the Madoff scheme. How it came about and who he was and and how he managed to get away, A, with such an enormous amount of, of money and B, for so long. Unlike most fraudsters, he wasn't actually discovered. He turned himself in. And also, he had a legitimate business. I mean, Charles Ponzi was a massive chancer. He'd served time in a Canadian prison. He'd been involved in all sorts of schemes and scams ever since he immigrated to the United States of America from Italy. Bernard Madoff was Wall Street royalty. You know, he was a president of trade associations. He was one of the guys responsible for the electronification of equities trading. He was kind of one of the people behind the National Association of Stock Dealers Automated Quote System, which is NASDAQ as we have it today. Um, He was not a minor character. People generally knew him for his broker-dealer business. The hedge fund that he ran was something that was much less publicized, and it went on for ages. It was one of the biggest Ponzi schemes there's ever been, possibly the biggest, and one of the longest lived, possibly the longest lived, but those things are connected. You know, the miracle of compound interest ensures that if something has gone on for a long time and it's declaring a decent market size return with low volatility, then it will be very big. Dan, can we just clear something up? When would you say Madoff really starts running his Ponzi scheme? Because watching the program, you you could sort of date it from virtually the late 50s, early 60s. But it really becomes a kind of massive racket in the late 90s or mid 90s, I suppose. Well, yeah, he was taking in money and he was telling people that they had investment returns. And there never seems to have been any actual program of investing the people's cash. It just came in and the investor letters got sent out and there were hardly ever any withdrawals. Certainly the, quote, split strike conversion strategy that he told people was the source of all the returns, that doesn't look like it ever really took place. And just, you know, if you look at some of the arguments that some of the people who were onto him made, he could never have been trading that way. Split strike conversion is a strategy. You or I would probably call it trading collars. Hang on, you're going to have to unpack that slightly. Trading collars, what does that mean? That sounds like something I've, someone on Dumbled on Journeyman Street. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, a collar is just basically a trade made up of two option positions, 
where you make money if the price stays in a range between the strike prices of those options. That's the same thing as a split strike conversion. Mm. They're all basically names for options trading strategies. Mm. And the thing about options trading strategies is you can make money out of them, but it's very rare to make money out of them in a smooth risk-free kind of way. Yeah. That's just not how option traders roll. But just just to go back, when would you date what ha- what is finally uncovered in 2008 from? Do you think it was 30 or 40 years or do you think it was more like 20 years? I think it was there from the start. So it was built up slowly over a long period of time with sort of exploiting people's trust and greed. Exploiting the fact that if you tell people that they're doing reasonably well in your investment fund, they don't take the money out of it. So is there anyone who has run a Ponzi scheme? Because generally, as as you've suggested, they come apart because of the tragedy from the Ponzi man's opposition of, of compound interest. The amount of money you have to keep on pulling in to keep people happy basically gets too large and you get overwhelmed. How does he manage to keep it going for that long? It's tricky. The only person who's ever done anything similar, as far as I know, (laughs) is uh, Sam Israel of Bayou Capital, who went on for quite a long time with a totally fraudulent hedge fund. But Sam and uh, Bernard were very different characters. Bernie Madoff was a pillar of the community and... uh, you know, a respectable figure. Sam Israel was the absolute opposite. Everyone who knew got into bed with him knew that they were getting into bed with a larger-than-life character. Madoff did the same thing as Ponzi, which is that he exploited affinity groups. A lot of the people that he conned were his friends, particularly the New York Jewish community, were badly exploited by him. He was on the board of trustees of Yeshiva University, and uh, Yeshiva University got ripped off by him. Later, as it got bigger, you know, as you get bigger, you basically grow beyond anything that an affinity group can uh, handle. So he had what I think is his genuine innovation to this fraud, which was the use of feeder funds. And feeder funds were just basically funds of funds that only invested in Madoff. They were people who were meant to go out and create their own affinity groups effectively. And so you had all of these feeder funds that really didn't know anything about the fund that they were putting their clients' money into, other than that it reported really good numbers and particularly really good risk-adjusted numbers. And in the pre-2008 world of uh, International Fund of Hedge Fund Sales, reporting a really good sharp ratio seems to have been enough. And in the television documentary, its very strong message is that the reason why these hedge funds or these funds of funds, as you call them, basically put the money into Madoff, even though, okay, he's Wall Street royalty and all the rest of it, but he has this implausibly profitable trading strategy, is that he says, you don't have to pay me any fees. I'll do it for nothing. Is that not the moment where, even if you're a relatively dim Wall Street genius, you start to think, hang on, that's a bit, that's a bit of a good deal? <laughs> the word at the time Madoff fell apart was that yeah. people thought that the source of the returns was that he was front-running clients of his brokerage business. Oh, and so people so thought, firstly, that they were being smart and that they were being a little bit crooked themselves. And obviously, there's no one easier to con than someone who thinks that they're a crook themselves. And also, they thought he was therefore extracting his fees by his proportion of the front running profits or his proportion of the bid ask spread running through his broker dealer. So he was a crook who was basically cutting in a whole lot of subsidiary crooks for nothing. (laughs) Exactly. Everyone thought that they were being given a chance to uh, share in some of his ill-gotten profits. What I don't understand is there was no evidence of any counterparties because there was no actual trading. That seems to me extraordinary to have gone on as long as it did, fooling everybody. Why do you think he managed to do that? Well, he had a crooked accountant who uh, was his sidekick. And reconciling fake trading records to show that they're fake is difficult. You probably couldn't do it now 
because the SEC has got a lot better at matching these things up with machine learning and sort of big data science uh, kind of systems. So they will do it electronically. But, you know, back in the 2000s, the trading records that he did submit via his uh, crooked accountants to the SEC were just a huge stack of paper. And someone would have had to have gone through them, matching those up to an equally huge stack of paper from the exchange records. And no one really thinks to do that sort of thing unless they're already suspecting criminality. So I think the question then comes back to why didn't anyone suspect criminality? And the answer to that is they did, but they somehow couldn't get the SEC to believe them. We will come to that in a second, because that's one of the absolutely amazing things about the story is how it comes about that the SEC starts to get tip offs from well, certainly one rival firm saying, you know, you've got to investigate this. But so we're in the late 1990s. Everything seems to be going swimmingly. He's taking in billions of dollars. He's handing billions back to relatively various lucky individuals. But the whole thing is we're told, you know, this is totally top secret. No one's supposed to know about it. And indeed, in, in the early 90s, he has his first run in with the SEC when a couple of accountants who've been feeding him lots of money then it's only about 400 million that's at stake, get rumbled. And he's told it's clear he shouldn't be running this fund at all. And yet he carries on. People are even writing articles about it saying these amazing returns he's getting. How is he doing it? But he's not supposed to be running a fund. So why at that stage doesn't anyone step in and say, what the hell's going on? One of the things that really happened here is that Madoff displayed the one absolute characteristic of the wrongans in this industry, which is that when anyone asked him any questions, he got nasty. Mm. So if any investors started asking for information, he would start losing his temper and threaten to kick them out of the fund. He had a kind of locked off area of the offices that the uh, employees of the broker dealer weren't allowed to enter. And he just dealt with questions by losing his temper and becoming aggressive. And at that point, it actually requires quite a special kind of person to keep on asking questions when someone who's much higher status than you are, much richer than you are, is just losing your temper and letting you know that you're going to have to escalate this to a big interpersonal conflict if you're going to get the information that you want. Yeah, or you'll uh, for, be forced to get your money back. Yeah, <laughs> the most that, terrible fate. Yeah, quite. <laughs> <laughs> and never darken said, my door again. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's, that comes to the, the really great bit of this, which is, of course, that the reason his nemesis finally appears on the scene is because a rival firm in Boston called Rampart kind of gets wind of all this and says, how the hell is he doing it? We, and they get their quant guy, a fellow called Markopoulos, and they say, you figure out what he's doing so we can sell it. And this guy, Markopoulos, basically spends a few weeks and he figures out pretty quickly it's absolutely mathematically impossible. And he gives the whole thing to the SEC. He says, he literally writes it could be one of three things. It could be insider trading which was the thing you just said so investigate it could be he's just incredibly lucky but investigate or it could be that it's a ponzi scheme and yet they still do nothing yeah it's pretty incomprehensible to be honest and <laughs> you know no one's got a particularly good theory of why the sec sat on that file you don't want to be too tough on the sec they've got a lot of other things to do it's an underfunded organization etc cetera, etc cetera. but yep. everyone seems to think that the SEC is very good at catching small-time insider dealers who do really easy to prosecute things and send emails saying that they're doing them. They're not so great at things that are a little bit out of the ordinary. So we've talked about his ability to bully people. I suppose I, the one thing which I thought about made of the more I watched the story was the parallel which absolutely made itself kind of or, or presented itself to me was that he was he was a bit like Robert Maxwell. He was a he was a bully. He put his his family in the business so he basically could trust the people around him, not to ask stupid or or actually very intelligent questions. 
and he flew into rages tactically whenever anyone appeared who sort of wanted to know more than more information he wanted to give them. Do you think he's a bit of a Maxwellian figure? Maxwell is a very good comparison. I have a few other names uh, at the back of my mind. <laughs> okay, They're alive. <laughs> that Maxwell personality is not at all uncommon. Many of the chief executives <laughs> of banks that went badly wrong and had to be bailed out by the British taxpayer were not necessarily oh. criminals, but were people who it was pretty difficult to ask questions about detail that they didn't want to answer. Well, we're naming no names there. But this is... A distant skirl of bagpipes has suddenly struck up. (laughs) (laughs) What do you mean? (laughs) I've got a knighthood, so I'm all right. Yeah, yeah, you know, these people like to accumulate things like knighthoods, like prestigious chairmanships of boards. They like to build up their social status because it's another yeah. layer of defence for anyone looking at yeah. them. I want to come back to another fascinating thing about Madoff. There are so many dogs that didn't bark in this story, but um, one of the consequences, of course, of having having no no stocks and shares anywhere was that he had a lot of cash from time to time. So for years and years, he runs this bank account at J.P. Morgan with between three and six billion dollars in it at any one time. Somehow, J.P. Morgan never seems to think, I wonder why, wonder why Bernie Madoff has six billion in his account this week. The only thing that happens to them is they get to pay a fine of a hundred million bucks or something. I mean, it's extraordinary. But this, you know, this comes back to my central point that I'm always going on about. Yeah which is there is no Nigerian Bernie Madoff and never will be. You know, there is no Greek Madoff. There will never be a Lebanese Madoff because in low trust economies, people check up on these things and people suspect them. In places like the USA and Canada, they're high trust economies. If you're at JP Morgan and you've got a client with a $3 billion bank account, your processes are to set up to make sure that the transfers into and out of that bank account have been done properly and in compliance with uh, the relevant uh, regulation. You're not set up so as to ask yourself, is the whole damn thing a massive fraud? Where would you rank the UK in this league table? the (laughs) the The UK is and always has been the place where the world goes to do things it's not necessarily keen on being seen done at home. I think you said earlier, is it your view that he would, he might never have been discovered had 2008 not come along? Because it basically, the one thing he's fed off is the fact that the feeder funds have carried, kept their money in and the, you know, the Jewish investors from New York have kept their money in and all of a sudden everyone wants their money back. Is, Is that the only reason why it falls apart? I think basically, yes. You know, I mean, given his age and physical condition, mm. it would have seen him out if 2008 hadn't happened. You know, he, <laughs> he would have been able to keep it going for the rest of his life. He wouldn't necessarily have yeah. handed on a great legacy to his family members who were working there. <laughs> uh, but well, that's really yeah, sad, you know, sorry. everyone was happy to let their accrued illusory profits ride. A mm. lot of them actually in the bankruptcy litigation were very disappointed to find out that the only claims that they had were for the money they'd actually put in, not for the years and years of compounded investment gains that they thought they'd been getting. You know, it was still a bull market for hedge fund inflows. There's absolutely no reason why outflows would have exceeded those for that fund unless we had 2008. But doesn't if it eventually collapse in, under the weight of its own yes. internal inconsistencies? I mean, $60 billion is quite a lot. If we were talking about $600 billion, which is where it would get to quite quickly at the way he accumulated okay, yeah. it, that would be start showing on you know, national balance sheets. You'd see it in space. That's why his, he was clever, and he was cleverer than Ponzi, in not promising a crazy compound return. So he he understood the mathematics of compound interest a bit better. At the sort of low volatility, 6 or 7%, 10% in a good year rate that he was going, he's got a doubling time of about 8 to 10 years. So from Mm. 60 billion, he goes to 120 billion, 
which would be a very big hedge fund, but I think not quite the biggest, then he might go to 240 billion. And right now you really are knocking on the door of the biggest hedge funds in the world. But he could then double again before people start saying, (laughs) right, this is literally more money than you can invest in any of the markets he claims to be trading. in." So yeah, I think it could have gone on for at least 20 more years. But can we talk a bit about one thing which I found absolutely fascinating from this story, which is, of course, the problem of unwinding a Ponzi scheme when it fails? Because as you've touched on just now, there's a big problem about whose claim is good. Mm. And basically what they did, what the trustee does in this case, he's a guy called Irving Picard, is he says he's going to apply what's called the net equity formula, which yeah. is if you're ahead i.e. if you put in some money, but you got out more than your stake, yeah. you have to put some back into the pot. Yeah. And if you basically got put it, if you put in some money and you didn't get it back, you're one of the claimants who gets some of the money that's clawed back from the others, which of course is, is really tough because actually the people who ended up getting clawed back were often kind of grannies from sort of Florida who'd yeah. been living off the income from this thing for 30 years. I can see how he had to do it because that's the way the uh, bankruptcy code works for those kind of things. And you can see why the bankruptcy code is written up that way, Mm -hmm. Um, as well as the uh, grannies who'd been living off income from their made-off funds. There were two or three big investors who were early in the queue and whose withdrawals gave Madoff the understanding that the game was up, who actually had a very nasty time with uh, Picard and with the uh, SEC and with the authorities. Because, of course, if you take out all of your profits just before the thing goes bust, then you have some uncomfortable conversations where you have to prove that you weren't part of the scam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) There's one particular one who does seem to have had a very odd relationship with the fund. Because I think one of the things which comes out is that not all clients got treated exactly the same when it came to returns. And some people who are helpful to the scheme were getting significantly higher than the 9% or whatever it was that he was promising the average guy on the street. So there's one guy called Jeff Pickauer, who's some sort of tax dodge kind of uh, specialist, an accountant who basically, I think he put in about 400 million bucks and he got out over the life of the thing between 7 and 8 billion. And at one point, he ended up basically... Picard turned up so much dodgy evidence about him that he ended up at the bottom of his own swimming pool rather than face the music. Yeah. But he on he was getting returns of 950% in some years. <laughs> so there was a lot of funny stuff going on behind the, the yeah. scenes. You know, and when you've got people like that, Irving Picard is definitely going to say, you know, I'm looking to the investors who made money out of this. And I'm going to investigate all of them. And I'm going to try and claw back on the net equity principle. And he did. He did. He clawed back seven billion from Picower's estate, which is quite something. Although a billion of it went to his own fees. Looking at the, well, why not? (laughs) Um, Looking at the the sort of picture, if Madoff had been slightly less greedy and every now and then showed a small fall in the value of your underlying investment, he would probably still be doing it today. He might have. Harry Markopoulos wouldn't have caught him if he had been less absurdly window dressing of the returns to show a less absurdly perfect profile. But then 2008 would still have come along. Mm. So you would still have had people who'd lost enough money on their other investments that they felt they needed to liquidate their made up on which they thought, well, at least that's sound. I can always get money out of that. The way that Madoff would have got out of this and the way that you would have written it up if it was a Hollywood film starring George Clooney would be to have claimed to have everything invested with Lehman Brothers <laughs> and then just walk away from it saying, what a tragedy, the entire fund's gone to zero, can't be helped. I was robbed. Just one thing, which is, do you think, I mean, we talked a bit about the regulators and the system. Do you think it's, we're better protected against the next Madoff? It is harder to do specifically what he did because... It is now much harder to have your audited returns coming from a tiny accountant firm that you control. It is harder to submit completely fake trading records because you have to submit them electronically and they go through a lot more checks. So you couldn't really do made off in the particular markets that he did it in. 
if you wanted to do a fraud of similar size in the investment industry, there's always something there. We've not really we've, we've not changed the conditions of supply and demand, so someone will organise the kind of technology to do it. I would imagine that if you wanted to do something similar to Madoff in the venture capital industry, yeah. you couldn't do it with a normal VC fund because those have a determined life and the permanent capital and the permanent long-term compounding was a big part of the Madoff scam. But someone will invent some kind of structure in which you can carry out this kind of fraud because they're really very lucrative. Okay, last word on Madoff. Why do you think he did it? Okay, a billion is not nothing, but the, one of the arguments is he did it because he's a people pleaser. He basically, he was the guy who could, who always wanted to do his best for his clients. And when he couldn't, he couldn't make it, he just faked it. Do you think that's possible? I mean, my guess is just literally that he started doing it and then didn't stop. He started you can't. doing it yeah. without ever really thinking that he'd made a lifetime commitment mm. and it grew big enough that he then obviously couldn't stop doing it because it was now serious money that would involve serious jail time. And I think he just started doing it without really thinking what he was getting into and that didn't necessarily understand that he'd be doing it 40 years later and didn't understand that if he was doing it 40 years later, it was going to be uh, whatever it was, $60 billion. <laughs> That was A Long Time in Finance with Jonathan Ford and Neil Collins. Production and editing by Nick Hilton. And our sponsorship partner is Briefcase.News. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review it on your podcast app as that will help new listeners find us.